cool. Yay. Okay, sweet. So, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, really looking forward to having Mayank here to talk about some of the best practices, tools, and frameworks for product managers to effectively lead this prioritization process. Um, I want to start by sharing just a little bit about the APM Club. Um, we're a global community of early career product managers, so still getting our feet wet or aspiring to be PMs in some cases, um, just trying to figure out um, some of these best practices and tools to really help us succeed and like accelerate that learning and development, as well as just make friends um, with people who are going through similar roles. So um, that's what we're here for. And we're bringing in my act today to talk about prioritization, because this is one of those unfamiliar um, and kind of tricky sometimes processes that we have to go through as PMs. So um, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you. Super excited to hear from you about your experience um, getting to PM and now being one at Facebook for several years. So um, yeah, awesome. Looking forward to hearing from you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that intro, Madeline. Uh, I can't share my screen. Do you mind enabling screen sharing for me? Totally. I'll um, try to add you as a host as well. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, and I can keep talking in the meantime. So I like everyone. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm late. I was just running behind because I was I went to pick up my daughter. Uh, so she's in the daycare. Sorry about that. So anyway, um, I'm my uncle, product manager currently at Facebook, uh, working on uh, Facebook shops. I lead the international expansion for Facebook shops. Uh, so what I was supposed to do in the beginning, tell you about my journey. Okay, let me share the screen and tell you what the journey. Melvin, I, can, I can't still share my screen, uh, just FYI. All right, I'll keep talking about my journey a little bit and then we'll go straight into about the discussion today, which is prioritization. Well, uh, I mean, every PM's journey has is, is a unique one, I, I believe, uh, in our own ways. Um, mine is similar. I got my first into, I mean, I came to Colombia from India to study uh, do a master's and uh, there uh, the goal was primarily to uh, meet more people and really not study much that was the objective and and that was met I uh, didn't do really well in my first semester anyways long story short uh, travel the world but was part of uh, different uh, ecosystems globally especially in Europe and, and the US and uh, that gave me exposure to what uh, people are doing in technology um, and open up the space of building products and always wanted to start my own company. That didn't happen. And PM seemed to be a good way to, uh, I wouldn't say live that dream, but take steps towards it. And I got my first internship uh, through an elevator pitch in an elevator in New York, which is amazing. And it happens. So keep pitching wherever you see people and you never know what can happen. Uh, and since then, yeah, eBay happened after that as a first job of, uh, and that opened doors because once you have a big uh, sort of uh, Silicon Valley company under under your banner, uh, it does open up. Uh, uh, it does op open up different doors. So anyway, that was great. Uh, worked on international expansion for their uh, products in the U.S. Take them to global markets. That was fun. Travel the world. You know, it was all good stuff. And especially again, Germany, Europe was my focus market. But the idea was, um, uh, what's I mean. It was great. eBay is again, good company to learn and stuff, but it was slower than what I expected it to be. So I kept reading TechCrunch as we all do, or any other articles uh, or publications and uh, Uber just raised their first round. And I was like, oh, interesting. It's a marketplace. Uh, until this time, I didn't know I love marketplaces, but after eBay, I was looking for marketplaces to, to sort of go and build something. And Uber just raised their very big round from Google at 3.4 billion valuation at that time. So just started cold calling and emailing and applying like all oh, we all do. So keep trying. Uh, and so, and I did the same thing for other companies too, but uh, Uber, you know, called me. I was their fifth product manager. Good learnings there. Uh, stayed there for about a year. Um, wasn't a really fit for me, I would say, from a culture perspective, but I learned a lot in terms of uh, what do you call blitz scaling? So it's less about strategic thinking. It's more about how do you build products that are global first and not US first and scale it quickly to help Uber go from when I joined, I think 20 cities to 120 cities when I left. So good learnings there too. But by this time, I was very clear that marketplaces drive me 
And um, what I want next is something earlier than Uber, which is, let's say, just hit product market fit or pre-product market fit, uh, but in the marketplace space. So again, started scouting what is next to which are the new upcoming marketplaces and uh, home services and industry was growing at that time. So, well, yeah, and then I applied to different companies, spoke to founders, and uh, that's when I moved back to New York and uh, worked on Handy, which was acquired by Ages List recently with the marketplace for home services. So you want to find a plumber, uh, you know, a home cleaner, et cetera, you can find it, uh, through this platform. So a lot of learnings there, demand side uh, validation, the definition of product market fit, what, how do you define the value of users, the cost of acquisition versus the retention that you want from them, the long-term value, all the foundational elements you can think about from a demand and supply side. How do you get cleaners or plumbers at a scale that is unimaginable with a lower cost? How do you build technology to solve those problems? And, it's, uh, and, and, the, and the list goes on and on. So it, it set a very good foundation. In the meantime, I was again talking in conferences, talking about the journey uh, within Handy or from Uber Learnings that also gave a good exposure to um, uh, meeting more people beyond that small network of sort of New York community and, and go beyond. So I spoke at multiple conferences again in Europe because I love to travel there. Anyway, long story short, then how Facebook happened. Uh, I applied to Facebook. Okay, this is another interesting one and then I'll move to you know questions and then to the topic. So I was um, enjoying Handy a lot, great founders. I love working with everybody there and there's no reason to leave. Uh, and then I applied to Facebook, I think in my, after a year and a half or two maybe at, at Handy. And then I got the job, but I realized I still can learn even more at Handy at that time. And New York was still home by then. Um, so I skipped, I, I could have moved to New York with Facebook. I mean, be in New York with Facebook, but I said no to Facebook at that time and, and still worked with Handy for another, I would say year. And then I realized what Slacking is an ecosystem where I can learn from people who are way older than me in the profession, way more experienced than me, way better than me in the profession. And I thought um, it's time to, to go to one of those ecosystems. And that could be a Google or Facebook and Amazon, any large company where you have that, um, product management culture and leaders who you can learn from because after a point you can't just learn by doing you have to learn by uh being with people around you who are better than you who make you better who help you pull up into the into the learning experience and into your profession so anyway then facebook happened and long story short at that time and again coming to facebook still that entrepreneurial story continues and then anyway i was given the charge to launch a new vertical within marketplace for homes and then for scaling it, taking it to international markets. A lot of traveling happened, met a lot of people, did a lot of talks, maybe like now it's been 30, 40 talks I've done in the last couple of years. So I think the journey has been quite interesting. Uh, and now I lead um, uh, one of the core initiatives for Facebook, uh, Facebook shops. You can, if you're an influencer on Instagram or a brand on Instagram or Facebook, you can sell through Facebook as a, as a real e-commerce experience. So I lead the expansion of that. Uh, globally. So global became my thing. Marketplace became my thing. Zero to one became my thing. So suddenly uh, the dots connected and, and you are a brand in terms of telling your story that you are the one who builds marketplace. You are the one who takes marketplaces global and you know something about building zero to one products. So that became my story and that's my journey. I'll, I'll pause here before I go into the topic of discussion today and let's make it conversational. So we should open up for questions at any point of time. And uh, I have very few slides. So it'll be always a conversation. So I'll pause here, Madeline, and please open up for questions. Awesome. Yeah, I love that you literally got started with an elevator pitch. I think that's such a fun story to share. Um, I'll ask a question that I have and then definitely would love for anyone else to jump in. Feel free to use like the raise hand. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't used Zoom recently, but do whatever works best. Um, one question for me is just you mentioned like working with other PMs who can kind of like pull you up through mm -hmm. your career. And I think that one thing I've noticed early on is that like, although we have a lot of crossover with other PMs, there's still a lot of like independent work, right? Like I have a work stream or like a scope that I um, am responsible for. And then like other PMs are responsible for their own thing. How did yeah. you go about maybe like identifying mentors or like yeah. opportunities to kind of learn by example? 
Yeah. Should I should I do a Elon Musk here in Clubhouse <laughs> and pull someone into a conversation? Oh, totally. I have already <laughs> seen people who are attendees, and some of some of them are doing a really good job in that regard. Okay, I will pick someone and and let's see how they react. So Ashok is from Facebook here. Ashok, do you want to join and have a conversation? Do you mind? Let's do it, Mike. Oh, brilliant. I love this. Awesome. So yeah, see, Ashok became my lad now. Anyway, if you know the story. Uh, so I think Ashok uh, joined Facebook recently uh, and a great, great example of an emerging product leader. Like he is, I would say, he has been proactively reaching out to people uh, within Facebook and outside Facebook to extend his, uh, I would not say network, rather knowledge base by learning about people's experiences and applying uh, to his journey or maybe not apply to his journey and that he thinks he's not important and he shouldn't do that, but do something else. I'll let him say how he started because it's quite recent in my journey and then I can talk about my story. Ashok, how do you reach out to people and uh, connect with them who are, let's say, a little bit ahead in the product management journey than you? Yeah, sure. We'll talk about my perspective, right? And, and Mike is right. I joined Facebook or Instagram more specifically probably a year or so ago. Uh, my approach to it is, you know, just, just being super open-minded and keeping an eye out for um, opportunities and mutual connection. Um, in this case, for instance, I've actually seen Mike's talks in the past and, you know, he was a familiar face and it was as simple as me just opening up Facebook's work chat and just reaching out to him. And, you know, one thing you notice at some of these big companies is people are very, very open to conversation, very, very open to sharing their experiences and providing advice. It's also their way of giving back to the community, right? So that's, uh, you never know until you actually reach out and uh, until you ask. But my advice there would be just to figure out intersections, commonalities between or among folks that you uh, aspire to uh, learn more from and, and, and just practically reach out and take it from there. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Ashok. Let me add some more color to what he did to me, okay? Just to, and, and, and how I also find value in it. So you'll understand both sides of it. So yes, he's right. He did ping. It just happened. We started chatting. First chat, we shared, we knew each other. Well, he put a second time on my calendar. I didn't know what we would chat about. I don't know. I don't think even he knew what we chat about. But then it became what sharing our journey. So uh, from that call to the next call. And I shared, well, my next uh, big thing is I want to write uh, in Wall Street Journal. This is a topic I'm thinking about. He shared a new course that he is uh, sort of working on uh, in machine learning. I feel as you find, like you have to remove the inhibition of reaching out uh, and do it, uh, whether it is cold calling, whether it is you like someone for some reason, find a common ground and just say hi. And, and it, can, it can be about learning about the experience. It can be learning about a topic that they are close to it and see how it goes. And honestly, what worse can happen? They say, no, good. They were not the right people for you anyway. This is to say, no, <laughs> move to the next one. So I think there's no real uh, playbook, but not trying is not the playbook. That's awesome advice. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and see if anybody else has questions. Feel free to jump in. Um, and if not, maybe we can get started on the prioritization. Yeah. I see a question from just M. I don't see the name there. M, go for it. Okay, the thumbs, okay, the hand raised went down. All right, so no questions. So we'll get into the topic then. And by the way, you can ask any questions right now, uh, which can, it doesn't have to be with prioritization as a topic. Anything you want to ask about product management, how to do X, how to do Y. Okay, cool. Alex, Sandra, go for it, Alexandra. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um. There's. I don't specifically have a question, but I know there's a couple of Slido questions in the Slido. And um, do you guys mind if I ask the first one, the one that's highly rated? Go for it. Awesome. Yeah. So um, uh, question is how does prioritization differ from products in different uh life cycle stages, like zero to one, growth, like etc. I guess. Hmm. Very interesting question. I think this is a good starting point. I mean, thank you, Alexandra. Uh, how is prioritization different for a zero to one product versus a mature product versus a growing product versus a random product? Exactly. Uh, we will address that today. Uh, I will not answer the question of how to prioritize. I'll rather answer the question of, of how to think about prioritization, how to set the foundation for prioritization, and that will cover um those 
those questions. And I'll, I'll, I'll remind me of going deep into zero to one and uh, a growth stage product. I'll give an example of how to do that. So thank you for the question. Any other questions or thoughts about even prioritization is fine, something else before we jump in? Okay, I see no. All right, cool. So what's your agenda for today? Very simple, how to approach prioritization will be a first topic. Here I'll talk about um, some foundational thinking, uh, no rocket science, pretty straightforward. And then leave you guys with one simple framework. I think you know about that framework. I'll just reiterate that and then we'll, uh, and then we'll open up for Q and A. Sounds good? Okay, so awesome. Mm -mm. Oh, this is my template slide, guys, skip it. So, so many ideas how to prioritize. That's what people think about when they think about prioritization as a problem. And I think Alexandra mentioned, she has a question in mind about, well, yes, but it's also based on the stage of the product. It gets complicated. When you have a mature product, you have a metric, you can use that to optimize in terms of cost benefit analysis, et cetera, et cetera. But it might be difficult when you look at uh, things like, okay, I see something jumping in uh you have a zero to one product when you don't have anything to optimize for so how do you prioritize fair fair question uh so i think the step one here is to really forget about prioritization and i'm not even think about uh what features what ideas what solutions and rather focus on setting a very strong foundation and I believe as product leaders, as product managers, as aspiring PMs, whoever you are today, uh, that's where we get lost. I used to get lost in that where I was all about ideas when I was starting my journey at eBay. Well, this is a great idea, let's go do it. Ideas have no value, I keep talking about it, unless they're set in the context of something, unless they're put in the context of something. something. So, so for instance, um, I'll take an example quickly and then go into the foundation piece. Uh, I asked somebody, uh, how will Spotify grow their business? No, sorry, how, uh, what would you do if you are uh, you're the CPO of Spotify, or what would you build to uh, improve Spotify? And they assume revenue was the most important thing and everything became about revenue, but that's not true. Uh, it depends actually what you want to optimize for or what you want to build. It could be just about discovery. It could be about better user acquisition. It could be about something else. So they came up with new ideas on how to increase revenue, but it didn't matter because nobody cared about revenue at that time. When we discussed the question, it was more about how do we improve experience of shopping, uh, Spotify in a country like India. So I think laying the strong foundation, the step one is to understand the problem really well. And as product leaders, I will just share what I mean by laying a strong product foundation and then tie it back to uh, product strategy and then tie it back to goals. And then we talk about prioritization. Okay, so this is where things get tricky when we are starting our career as PMs or even mature PMs. Uh, we forget about these things, the most important things that every leader cares about, the mission of the company. People think it's a, just for the sake of it. Or the company strategy. There are people who don't even know what the company strategy is sometimes. Uh, and then the product strategy comes next where, sure, the product strategy is your foundation to think about your road mapping and setting product goals, and which actually is a part of prioritization. Roadmap is a part of prioritization. But if you have a very weak product strategy, whatever you do in, in the roadmap, uh, road mapping process, it does not matter. Uh, I think, so a weak product strategy would be something that does not ladder up to the company's mission or company strategy or your organization strategy. I think I tried to take an example of Spotify here again. Imagine the mission for Spotify is help people discover music globally. Now you may have 10,000 ideas on how to make Spotify amazing. Let's add a social feature. Let's add short music to it. Let's add a clubhouse feature to Spotify. But does it really connect with the overall company strategy is what makes you successful and what will set a foundation for prioritization slash road mapping. So for instance, if the company strategy is uh, after the mission, help more people to discover music by focusing on three things, 
bring more new users to propel new growth, increase music selection, and make music discovery easy to help discover okay, to help discovery of music once users are in the app. If these are three pillars the company is focusing on, and you are focusing on a new bet, which is called, let's say, Clubhouse or audio, instant audio meetings, it doesn't matter. It doesn't ladder up. It may be a great idea. It may be a cool idea. When you go and prioritize, it doesn't fit the bill. So no matter what the strategy is, you may not believe in the company strategy sometimes because you know it's sometimes nuanced because the information the leader has, you may not have all the information. Uh, it's very important to ladder up. So for instance, if, a, if it's a growth team and they pick a strategy which is increase relevance to enhance music discovery and be measured by increased number of plays, well, that's a very strong strategy, a very strong foundation which really ladders up to the company strategy. It makes perfect sense. Versus somebody coming up with an idea saying, let's go build an audio uh, streaming service for instant communication or rather a group meeting that does not ladder up. So again, it should never be a part of setting the foundation. Okay, I'll pause here for questions on uh, the value of mission strategy, uh, product strategy and roadmap and the value of laddering up to it versus just working on a silo on your piece of work. Any, any thoughts and or questions or feedback here? I can wait. Go ahead, guys. Anyone? Oh, wow. I have two questions. One from Balaji. Go for it, Balaji. What's your question? Uh, hey, Mike. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, workshop or webinar. Uh, I had a quick question about the product strategy and when you, especially when you said like we need to ladder it up to the uh, mission and company strategy or what the company actually wants to do in uh, long mm -hmm. term. Uh, but it's kind of a top-down approach, right? Uh, drilling it down from the mission and down to the uh, actual features of the product. There might be some instances where uh, there might be some needs or immediate requirements by the users, mm -hmm. uh, which might not be exactly aligned with the uh, mission statement or the company strategy. Mm -hmm. It might be a little bit tangential or there might be other issues like some legalities, like if, even in the case of Spotify, mm -hmm. it might be something related to copyrights mm -hmm. uh, management or something like that. So mm -hmm. when there are two conflicting, like uh, it's not uh, when there are requests or like ideas, which is not exactly aligned, but then we need to still work on it. How do you like trade yeah. off between the yeah. two and how do you uh, prioritize them? Yeah, so I'll answer biology and then we'll go to the next question. I think that's pretty straightforward. If there is a regulatory problem or a legal risk that is stopping you to operate your product, uh, it's it's a it's a no fail moment. You have to make it right. It, you have to prioritize it over everything else. I think those are very easy to make an argument. It doesn't have to comply with the strategy or not. They can just be a part of. Uh, we are breaking up the, uh, the, our app or our product if you don't do this. And that's the rationale for doing it. You don't have to come up with a strong strategy to defend that. But the question is why, is, why your team should do it is a separate question. And why should that be on your roadmap versus others? So for instance here, um, let me take an example. For relevance, if you don't get uh, users, uh, users uh, permission to take their data and then recommend them new songs or songs by uh, through our uh, discovery engine, we cannot move forward. That's fair. That becomes a part of your strategy. Well, step one is to really understand the user needs uh, and take the permission to go forward. I feel the no fail ones should definitely be a part of your uh, strategy, provided it falls under your team's purview. Uh, and it's easy to prioritize them based on the rationale being legal versus non-legal. That's one answer. Second was the top-down thing. Um, see, like top-down stops at the company strategy in general. Like if you look at classic technology companies, and then it's on the product teams to come up with their own strategy. Strategy. So you will decide what goes in, what goes out. If you think the legal reason is the right reason to work on it, that's fair reason. You say this half. We are not focusing on our long-term growth or long-term approach, which is increasing relevance, but rather focus on the unbreak or no-fail asks. And here are the five things we'll be focusing on. 
and will resume the work next half. But the fact that you address it, acknowledge it is more important. All right, I'll go to Abhinav, what's your question? Hey, Mike, thank you for doing this. Uh, so when I listen to you talk about product strategy, I immediately start thinking about, especially the ladder that you mentioned, right? Uh, I start thinking about the customer uh, you know, benefit ladder, which mm -hmm. we kind of you know, touch upon in the problem space when you actually go through the customer discovery process. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so in a lot of ways, you need to find out what their needs are. For example, the same thing that you mentioned can be kind of uh, relayed in a customer benefits uh, space too. The customer, for example, needs to be able to, uh, you know, be able to communicate with more users or be able to follow more users. That's mm -hmm. one of the things that we would do to increase or for, for a person who's, as a user, I would want to know more people that I know in Spotify so that I can follow them. So it, it kind of overlaps, right? So would this also be in the problem space or would this fall under the solution space? I mean, how does this fit under that though? Let me try to understand the question. So the question is, there are user problems and there is a strategy. How yes, they, as, as how a, they blend a team, we would be thinking about a lot of these things even during the customer discovery and customer benefit ladder phase, right? Yeah. That is even before we build the product, right? So, yeah, uh, yeah. totally. I mean, listen, uh, first, it's not one or the other. Uh, to get to product strategy and understanding that relevance is key to increase the number of plays, you have to understand the user journey you have to understand the key user needs in that process. Uh, I'm talk not talking about them. I think that, uh, how do you get to product strategy is a separate class altogether we can talk about. Well, how did I come to increase relevance to enhance music discovery? That, what makes you feel that increasing relevance will enhance music discovery, Mayank? That's a question. Well, separate question. We can come, we can focus, uh, we can focus on that separately and figure out well, it could be data-driven decision, it could be research-driven decision by understanding user journey, user problem, user needs, et cetera. And, and why is play is the right metric to measure the success of the strategy? That's also a fair question. Uh, all the things you're talking about on understanding the user needs or user behavior uh, will fall under coming up with the strategy, but taking those routes to come to this point. Make sense? Okay, understand. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so any other questions? All right, we'll move on then. So, so again, uh, the, the key takeaway here is uh, we generally come up with strategies that we think are important for the product, but unless it ladders up to the organizational strategy or the company strategies, the value of that product strategy is super low. Nobody will care about it. Uh, and same is true for the metric. Like somehow it should connect with uh, what you are what your org or the company is focusing on otherwise you're working as a hobby project which may not be important now why it's important for prioritization is it sets a very strong foundation so now you have a decision criteria or a metric that you or a decision foundation which you, which will be used to do the prioritization so what's next so let's say uh you come up with this whole uh strategy increase relevance to enhance music discovery that's your sort of mission or uh, the strategic direction that you have to set for the team then it comes down all right how can we get there you sit with the team together and come up with key themes that you may come up with which could be i'm just making it up here it could be improve ranking why because the team came up with some ideas in a brainstorming session or with data science research or user research you figured out that well, improved ranking does show that uh, relevance increases and number of plays go up. And, and then you figure out, oh, what are the ways to improve ranking? Ranking is how, what to show, when to show to the user. And then you make a list of bets. Well, we will add more content uh, metadata into the songs to make sure we can better understand the song. Well, we'll understand the user requirement, user needs before we, uh, and use that as a signal to influence our ranking, et cetera. And you make a list of bets there. Again, they're not prioritized. But the, the point I'm trying to make here is once you have this strategy, you can do a brainstorming session to go towards it, towards that direction of the strategy and come up with different themes to then come up with a list of bets that you want to make for the team. This is again very important because as you're going step by step, it's making sure that your thinking is foolproof. 
if someone asks you about an idea, oh yeah, it's about improved ranking. Well, we know that it helps in increasing relevance. So we are focusing on that, if at all that happens. So again, uh, focusing on the step-by-step -step approach gives you a very strong foundation to then go into uh, prioritization. Any, any questions here? Tell me how you would have done. Okay, we have a question, hang on. So I see Abhinav, you do have a question or you're just raising hand because you're chilling? Okay. Oh, I didn't realize. I'm sorry, I All didn't right. realize. Okay. I'm kidding. Okay, we have one question from, hang on, from who is this? Uh, Webov, go for it. Hey, Mayang, thanks again for doing this um, and apologies for the background sound. Um, so essentially, I just started at eBay a couple of months back as a PM. And uh, I work in the global growth org, uh, specifically on payments and shipping comms. Okay. And my question to you is, how do you, uh, how would you go about prioritizing in this sort of a setup where you have your own roadmap, but mm -hmm. you also have multiple teams kind of looking towards you and your support to achieve mm -hmm. line items on their stack ranks. Okay. So, um, the, you know, I, I understand that the PM role you know, usually you have a bunch of stakeholders that you have to take inputs from, or you you're answerable to in one way or the other. Uh, but in this role, I've I've come to see there are more stakeholders than usual. So yeah, that, that's my question for you. It's a great question. I think again, uh, if you have a strong foundation, if it ladders up to the company strategy and company's goals, it all makes sense. So think about this tree and replicate that, and replace it with goals. So mission, fine mission company goals or goals, product goals, uh, that is your basically, if you're part of I don't know, global shipping team, what is their goal and what's the company goal? I think that's a very interview question and interview answer. The answer is pick the shared goal that you think will help you have that conversation. And based on your roadmap, you can convince the other team. So uh, let's take an example, global shipping. So what you need is, you, there's a maybe a shipping label team and you are the team that will help uh, enable consumer, uh, consumer, sorry, sellers to create a shipping label, but you have to work with a platform team who actually owns the labeling system with USPS or UPS or FedEx. But how do you make sure you enable unlock, let's say a launch in the UK when they are focused only in the US? Well, then you tell them, you tell them the whole story. Well, listen, the, the strategy we have aligned with the leadership is on, uh, focusing on international growth uh, of, of our transaction, which will actually come through new shipping label creation, because we've seen that sellers who have the ability to create shipping labels ship faster, uh, do more business on a platform. And we think the estimated impact in the UK or wherever you're doing that is X percent or for a vertical is Y percent. And you helping us will help. And if and, and that leadership will definitely align with the story because they, they know that if you if you actually go do it, if you have seen data that shows the GMV will go up tomorrow, hence they will support you. Uh, they don't support you. The story is you just have a joint session with the leadership and, and tell you tell them the same story, mission, the org strategy, and how you ladder up to the org strategy. The moment you talk about that, you get prioritized. You get resourcing from the platform team or the team that you want to work with. I work with at least... Uh, eight right now, eight to 10 platform teams or, or relevant sort of teams. And they're all aligned because we are aligned at the leadership level. And that only happens when it all ladders up to what the company or the org strategy is. So I think when you write your strategy document, uh, if you start with why it's important for the organization or for the company, and then what are you doing ladders up to it, uh, the story becomes very clear and commitment from other teams become very clear. Does it answer your question? Yes, it does. I was just about to ask you on, you know, the, at the end of the day, the, the constraint is on the resourcing side, uh, but then you you kind of answered my follow-up as well. Uh, and I could see a lot of contextual uh, eBay, uh, you know, knowledge coming through as well. So thank you so much. Cool. We have one more question from Srinidhi. Go for it. Yeah. So uh, I'm also an early career product manager and uh, I, I would like to understand how we could prioritize between a greenfield idea or an idea which we know for sure, it, it's going to be a sure, short success. Though both these greenfield idea and the general idea relate back to the product strategy, company strategy that you mentioned. Uh, are there some tips and tricks or something like that to prioritize between these two? 
Yeah. I mean, listen, I'll not give you any, there's no rocket science. This is pretty straightforward field of work product management, right? It's basically English and we just put this into practice. Yeah, I mean, it's simple. If you have an idea that you know is a sure shot success and the impact is high, mm -hmm. uh, this is a classic, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, cost benefit analysis. If you know that the two bets and one bet will result in some impact, which is tangible and, and big enough for the company and for you to care about, of course, shut down the second project. Don't work on it. It's okay to say no. I think uh, I had both slides without working on it and finish it. Uh, it's okay to shut down your own team, in fact, if there is lack of alignment with the leadership. So, for instance, uh, if your product strategy that was said before and you inherit a team mm -hmm. and you think it doesn't line up with the company strategy, the org strategy, and let's say you try to change it, even then it's too far away from it. Stop it. Let's say you have two ideas uh, and one is most impactful. Uh, and the other is not, but the team was working on the other idea, but you think it's cool, but not impactful, stop it. You get value, you get credits to stop projects. You get credits to not do things versus do things and fail, uh, knowing that you will fail. So just executing for the sake of it is absolutely bad. That's one answer. And the second answer is, if you have 10 people, uh, instead of doing five, five and, and reducing the speed or velocity of delivery, you rather want to have all 10 working on one project where you know you'll definitely deliver, gain the respect and momentum as a product leader with that win, and then think about the next one uh, in a way where you reduce the risk and increase the impact. So I feel less is definitely more, uh, and you'll be very lucky to get an idea that definitely works. It's also hard to find, by the way, which definitely <laughs> works. But if you have one, yeah, just do that. Right, right, makes sense. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions on this or any other question? Okay, I think my, my key takeaway when I'm talking about this is we, we spend a lot of we, uh, emphasis on um, prioritization, which is very simple. It's cost benefit analysis. Once you have a set of ideas, you put them into some framework of themes or whatever you have pods, and you look at the cost and the impact or the risk involved in it. And based on that, you prioritize. It's not that difficult. I mean, I don't think it's that hard. The hard thing happens when you want to do everything and you don't want to say no to things. I think that's where either you start saying no, but if you think the impact is still high, you that's when you talk to the leadership and ask for more resourcing. That's how you grow a team. That's how you add more people to your team. Uh, but Prioritization is not a rocket science. It's absolute. Uh, the, the, I think the fact that you got to the level where you are now prioritizing, it means the work you have done so far is, is solid. But people fail because when the list comes out after prioritization, when someone sees it, they're like, oh, but, but why are you doing this? And, and how it ladders up? And why is it important? And that's because your foundation is weak. And I would say I'm just pushing for, as product leaders, spend a lot of time understanding your problem space, understanding the company strategy, figuring out a connection or building a strat new strategy that has a clear connection with the company strategy, then focus on some good broad themes after team brainstorming, and then figure out the, figure out the basic prioritization. After that, there's no questions left. It's very strong. It's, it's a solid framework and you can defend it every time. And then keep repeating the strategy, keep repeating your themes, keep repeating your roadmap. That's what makes it perfect. Okay, I'll pause here for questions. That's all I had. Awesome. Um, this has all been really amazing so far. Thank you so much. Um, we can definitely go through some of the top ranked, top ranked questions on Slido, if that works. Um, Let's do it. I'm happy to read them out or anyone feel free to raise your hand still. Um, the top one was already mentioned. It's how does prioritization differ for products in different life cycle stages? Ah, yeah, great, great question. How does prioritization differ from, uh, let me open the slide and tell you, I don't think it's about prioritization. Um, let me, how does prioritization differ for products in different life cycle stages? 
See, I think there are two types of life, uh, two types of stages. I would say one is you haven't launched and you're about to launch. Three. Second, you have launched, but there's less traction. So the numbers have no value, but something else has more value. And third, obviously, you're matured and, and numbers say everything. So that is clear. Forget about that. Uh, if you talk about uh, the first and the second one, so you're about to launch your product. Uh, the prioritization should be based on, again, I'll go back, a solid foundation that you have created. But what is that foundation for that? Like, for if you look at this story uh, we had here, of Spotify, of Spotify, well, it's about uh, increasing something that was already there, which is relevance. I'll give you an example of a zero to one product. Let's say, let me see if I have this slide quickly. Mm -mm -mm. Global, let me just, yeah. So for a zero to one product, this is my other talk I was trying to pull up. Not this. So I think the point I was trying to make is, as uh, I'll keep talking, you don't focus on any metric. You don't focus on any uh, core goals that you set uh, in terms of quantification of it. What you do is you talk about where you want to be as a North Star uh, in the next, let's say, a year, and you create milestones to get there. And when you talk about the prioritization framework for that, okay, I don't have it here. I'll not uh, bug you with my whole deck. When you talk about the, for instance, let's say, I'll, I'll take an example. Let's say you're supposed to launch in the context of the eBay thing. Let's, uh, let's say you're supposed to launch uh, eBay for, um, let's say, coins collect, coin, co coin collectors. So basically it's a marketplace for people to, uh, share their coins and someone will come and uh, list their coins and someone will come and uh, buy those coins. It's a new vertical you're building. So how do you set goals for this will define how would you prioritize. Now, if you think about the goals, uh, it, the goal cannot be about growth. The goal cannot be about number of transactions. The step one is to figure out what is the definition of MVP for that product. And that becomes your goal. There's no prioritization there. You just focus on understanding doing user research, doing ecosystem analysis to understand what is your MVP. And it will take three months for that, let's say or two months for that or one month for that. That is step one. So it's a milestone goal. Second, launch MVP. Because you have done the analysis to understand what is, okay, I'll stop sharing so you can see my space. Uh, because you have, uh, because you've done the understanding to figure out this again, when you set to prioritize, instead of adding a share feature or a story for coin collectors, you'll rather focus on the core needs for the user and, and use that as a framework to only prioritize that are critical for someone to come and list their coin, validate the coin is authentic, and someone to discover the coin through eBay and purchase that coin through some payment method. And that's your MVP. Any other ideas that float around that is not the critical path will not be prioritized. So again, once you have, it again becomes the MVP as a launch goal, but prioritization is based on the previous work, which is the definition of MVP. Step two should not still be about number of uh, transactions. It should be more about, uh, I need enough number of people and, and uh, coins on my platform, inventory on my platform to really play the game of product market fit because that's my next milestone. So my point here is defining milestones should be step one for any zero to one product. Step two is to figure out what exactly is required for each milestone and create an exit criteria for that. Once you have that, your prioritization will automatically fall into place and you will not push things that are not important. But you have to be brutally honest about things because people will push for ideas in the MVP phase that is not MVP. So be clear, look, going back to the step one, which was understanding what's a critical path or defining path of understanding the needs of the user and sellers to define MVP as a anchor to define MVP. So anything that is beyond that, will not be considered as a part of a prioritization. So does that answer your question about um, how to prioritize for zero to one? Whoever asked that question, but good question. Cool, so I'll summarize this. Take a milestone driven approach for zero to one products. 
set a strong foundation by understanding what the MVP is. MVP is also a milestone. Define that, use the learnings from the past to make decisions on prioritization and looking forward to the exact same thing for product market fit, growth, et cetera. And, and we can, I can share a note on that, which I'm writing uh, once it's complete. Uh, it does talk about examples of what we've done in the past. All right, next question. I think I have just a follow up on this. I know yep. you've done it a little bit before, but would love to kind of hear more about how you approach estimation in a zero to one space, like, or even with a new team. Like, for example, I work on growth and we yeah. have a ton of experiments in the past that like help inform us pretty well what the impact we might get on our metric will be from like a new project. But yeah. how do you yeah. do that when there is no project to look at? Yeah. That's a great question. Let me introduce two concepts here. One concept is one is a concept, other is a comment. So sometimes we don't know what to do and we don't have enough data to come up with. So specifically, specifically for a growth uh, product or uh, things that needs more, more understanding. And we haven't spent time on that. And we are at a stage where, oh, well, good ideas, but we don't have estimates and we need some time to go dig deeper or look at benchmarks on the market to figure out if this idea has potential. Uh, it's okay to take an understand work in parallel, which you'll do this half that'll help you in the next half. What that means is that two types of goals. One is a metric goal or a, a, there are many types of goals. Metric goal, launch goals, add a third type of goal into your road mapping, which is an understand goal. So as a product leader, preempt that understanding five or six important questions or three or two or one important question will help you unlock your next roadmap. So preempt that and put an understand roadmap onto your current roadmap, which means you'll start sometime and it'll be a lagging indicator, but it's a great one to start with for the next one. So is there, uh, insights are there. It's just that somebody has to work on it and the timing is not right. So put an understand work on your roadmap. That's number one. Two is, well, we don't have enough insight on uh, on an idea. It's okay to not have insights on one idea and and make a, uh, and, but you should have at least some hypothesis and the hypothesis should be backed by some user research or some insight that the, that the team has. My point here is, you may not know the quant, uh, the number impact. So let's say for Uber, you may not know the impact of uh, how will changing the content of uh, our landing page change the conversion. It's a very simple example, right? Uh, because if you go to Uber, Uber's landing page, they have multiple landing pages, multiple content, multiple designs, multiple formats, multiple images. But the hypothesis is we know that um, uh, different user connect to different type of content, but there are some content that are generic and we have done user research to figure out this content resonates more with uh, our 80% of audience or drivers, if it's a driver landing page who comes to the platform. But we don't know what the impact would be, but it's a fair bet to make in terms based on the signal we have from research. So you use the hypothesis uh, to come up with uh, the prior priority there as high because you have a strong signal that or medium that it will it, there is some wings and it can fly. The actual number of impact you don't know that, and and that's okay. Uh, that's one. But you might use some benchmarks from the past to see what's the best result you've got for an experiment like this. Uh, based on the current traffic, what uh, if you move it by that percent, how much it could be. So I think using data science here to use their judgment to come up with some extrapolation will be great. But if not, it's okay to have five hypotheses on a list of 20 where you don't have the numbers, but they're bets based on hypothesis from some insight, which could be user research, could also be market research. Does it answer your question, Madeline? One is Pick understand goals for every half. And second is uh, pick a hypothesis based on some user research work. And it's okay to have a portfolio of bets that are deterministic and there will be numbers and some may not. Totally. I love learning more about like how we can run understanding experiments or just like spending energy on understanding is super important to get that early signal. So that's awesome. And the next question up on Slido is, which stakeholders or cross-functional partners are involved in the prioritization process? Yeah, 
what do you think? I mean, somebody should answer this question before I take, give my answer at all. Okay. I know a lot of people today who are on call, but I will not do another uh, clubhouse moment. But yeah, anyone can tell me what do they think is the answer. Or you can raise your hand and answer this question, and then I'll give my comments on that. Who wants to go? Come on, guys, someone. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Um, so I, I think the mo like, it, there's like two things. One, Sorry, what's your name, where you work, oh, yeah. and then the answer. Yeah, dude, use the platform to get the visibility. Why not? At least sure, people sure. know you. <laughs> uh, let me, uh, let me turn on the light. I'm in the dark also. So <laughs> that's fantastic. Be, uh, let's be, yeah. Let, let's be proper. Lovely. Um, so yeah, so uh, my name is Max, um, from Montreal, Canada. Uh, product manager for two years now um, to answer well my take on the question is that you should always consider the, like all your stakeholders but down the line the prioritization is your to take as the product manager as in like you want to take their input but also a lot of client will try well we work a lot with client requests uh, we'll try to push uh, stuff on your roadmap and if you just listen to them then you'll never deliver other stuff so as a person at the center of all the stakeholders, you're the one who take the decision, but you should always take into consideration what comes yep. from others. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you all the way from Canada. I love Montreal, never been there, but seeing great pictures. Uh, cool, uh, I agree with him. Uh, it's very hard to prioritize if you have everybody in the room from all across functions. So um, a big no, but it's subjective again on how good your team is and what the definition of all is. Sometimes the definition of all just means engineering and design, let's be there, it's okay, let's do it together. Uh, the right approach here would be, um, everyone should have a voice in the team. So listen to what people are saying. So have a session to collect all the ideas. That's number one. Second, make it super transparent. What is the criteria for prioritization, which I talked about the foundation, right? The product strategy and the goal for the team should be clearly set before you go into brainstorming. So when you have all the ideas, people know that when, if they, they may have an idea to make the world better and it will be done provided it is in the context of the goal we have set. So it's fully, the rules are fully transparent. And then for the actual prioritization practice, to be honest, like pick your safe uh, group where you think your their opinion matters and they will be very objective about the goals and be very unbiased in picking and help you make a decision. Generally, I have what I've seen is uh, PM, data science, engineering, uh, sometimes design uh, really helps a lot in having in a room to to prioritize but again the rules should be super clear to begin with uh which could be anything that does not doesn't meet our goals um uh sort of uh, the goals for this half we shouldn't focus on them number one if the impact is less than x percent don't focus on that if it's not a real user problem backed by insight don't focus on that so if some rules are set i think uh having that four or five people in the group will be great but not everybody for sure Next awesome. question. I think we just have time for one more. So right. we'll go on. Um, how do you prioritize features when collaborating with other product teams, for example, platform product team yeah. that may have completely different success metrics? So essentially, how do you fight for prioritization? Cool. I see a hand raised, Apurva. Nice. Good to see you. Uh, we'll, we'll take one more quickly. I'll answer this and then take one more quickly. Um, how do you prioritize when it's uh, the goals are not the same goals or, or you're again, same thing, the metrics are different. So I think, first of all, you have to sell your dream uh, that yes, what you're doing is important. Yes, what you're doing is absolutely aligned with the leadership and they are bought into it. Once that happens, uh, you will ask for resourcing from different teams. Now, if you're not getting the traction, I think it's a good time to go back to leadership and say, listen, uh, for instance, the example of that uh, shipping label thing, I'm not, uh, the, the shipping label team, I mean, the platform team that is doing connections with uh, integration with FedEx and USPS, they don't have resources and we have to shelf this project. So you have an open conversation and then they, you obviously bring them in the meeting and have a discussion together. And it may happen that the leader might fund that team with a new resource 
or you might have to shelf the project and take it later. But the point I'm going to make here is it's not always your job to keep fiddling around with the world and convince them. Uh, you really have to have an alignment at the top level with the leadership first, and the leadership can be whatever level you are, maybe two level above or one level above, so they can help you. And if you're stuck uh, in this situation where the metrics collide, nothing can help you. You definitely need somebody from the top to come and make a decision. Uh, and it's okay to say no to a project. Again, I said, like, don't be scared of shutting something down. Rather, use it as a way to tell the leadership, we're shutting it down if you don't help us. And that's when they jump in. Okay. Cool. Apurva, go for it. Hi, Mank. Uh, thank you so much for this webinar. I think it was really helpful. I have a follow-up question on the previous question. Um, so a lot of times, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also like, I just started my career uh, in the hardware space being a product manager. So maybe it could be somewhat driven in the hardware space. But like there are certain decisions when you're designing a product and, you know, you don't have any preference from the customers or like any data around that. Um, and you still got to decide that, OK, if, you know, suppose that button needs to go in that product or not, but there are no uh, like no preferences around it. Uh, and it's not that important as well. Uh, about the preference, like, you know, if it would go where and that kind of stuff. So how would you suggest taking those kind of decisions? Uh, I mean, yeah. I don't know if exactly you would be able to relate to that since yeah. it comes more in the hardware space, but yeah. if you have any suggestions around that. I think we all come across similar, uh, but thank you for the question. We all come across similar situations where you have uh, as product leaders and also leaders in different organizations. I mean, if you mm -hmm. read books from C different memoirs or different CEOs, you'll find that they didn't know what is there, but they just did it for, for some reason. It may not be a button. It might be something else, but that's how, that's what they did. Uh, so, so I think you have no data, you have no insights, you have no time to take call but you have to make a call. Uh, I would say go with your instincts because that's where that's what makes you a product manager. That's what makes you a leader and trust your instincts. I'll give an example of that. Uh, we are over time so people can drop off if they want to. I'll finish this answer though. Uh, so this was, uh, we were launching uh, a very important product in the UK. And for our success, a partner, a big partner, let's call them supplier in, in, the, in the context of uh, hardware or in the context of marketplace, let's say a big seller was supposed <laughs> to work with us. And uh, at the end, they made, uh, so they put us in a situation where, I mean, uh, the team, the whole team where, if you don't, if you do A, B, C, they had set of requirements, only then we'll work with you. If not, we'll not work with you. Uh, and at the end, there's no way to say that it's a right or wrong call. It's, it's just, uh, if you look at the numbers, the value they bring to you is way, uh, it's a lot. Like they'll bring about, let's say 30% of your all inventory for that specific problem or, or that marketplace or that uh, hardware component would have come from that supplier. But the clause were very subjective. You can say yes, no, but it's a subjective call to be made by the PM. Uh, and everybody raised their hands and they said, PM, it's your call. If you if, they, if you say yes, they will agree to it. And uh, but these are three terms that we don't believe in it, but would be okay with it. It comes to your instinct and your fundamentals as a person. So there was one clause that was against how I would operate in an ideal world. And I said, this is exactly what we don't believe in uh, as individuals. We think this is a way where we will be uh, creating challenges in future. Even if it's a short-term gain, uh, instinctively, I think we should not do it. Rationale being, I don't see an upside in future. Maybe there's an upside here right now. So I think to your point, the button thing, you may make an argument. I think the button may be the wrong thing to do, but we don't lose anything to try it. Hmm. Okay. You've frozen or is it me? No clue. I think it's frozen. Okay. Yeah, he froze. Let's give it a minute just in case. Yeah. Because he was going through a like good yeah. good line of thought. It was a nice experience.
I hope we haven't lost him for good. <laughs> I hope he has another, I hope he can take another question. <laughs> right? Yeah, I think he's dropped off, not sure. He's gonna yeah, play. we'll see if he rejoins. Yeah. Okay. You're back, hey. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry, my bad. I don't know where I lost you, but the sunroom has a problem of uh, connectivity. Okay, anyway, did I answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. I think that was helpful. Uh, that's something that I should definitely incorporate and learn. <laughs> cool. So I think instinct and iterative learning can be a rationale to do something sometimes when you don't know what the right approach is. So that's what I will go with. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much for that. Cool. All right, Mayan, do you have any more time or do you want to close out? Uh, I can take one more. I was late. So um, yeah, let's take one more and then we'll close off if there is a question. David, man, nice to see you. Long time. Man, I am obsessed with your sunroom. I feel like when <laughs> I get that sunroom, I will have made it in life. And I feel like you give me inspiration. So... Thank you okay. for coming. Guys, meet David. He works for Disney now? Where, where, where are you working now? Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I work for Disney you. now. Lovely. I, I follow you wherever you go. <laughs> Good to see you. All right. Any other questions? Let me pick uh, who else I know. Um, yeah, that's pretty much. Awesome. Awesome. No questions, guys. Uh, great chatting. Um, this is an informal chat. Like we want to make more uh, sort of a conversation versus a monologue. So I hope it was uh, useful. Feel free to connect with me or if you have a question, an idea or a share, jam on, always happy to do that. Uh, yeah, that's that's all from my side. Melly, over to you. Awesome. Um, no, this has been amazing. Thanks for also like really engaging everyone. I think it's a breath of fresh air compared to your average Zoom call. So um, super helpful. And then uh, just if you wanted to share like best way to connect with you, I linked your LinkedIn, but if there's any other way, like let us know. Yeah, yeah. LinkedIn is, is great. Yeah, Sweet. of course. Yeah, cool. awesome. Thank you all. Take Bye. care. Bye. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Mayank. Thank, Thank you. Mayank. Bye. Bye. Thanks all. Bye.